one of the things I love about Easter is that it was always God's plan. It wasn't some backup plan that he had to come up with because man messed up, but he knew that man would not be able to do it on their own, but he was going to be willing to send his son to die the death that all of us deserve so that we could live the life that we didn't. And so as we celebrate Jesus' resurrection today, we're continuing in our, our series on Romans, and we're going to be looking through the chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8, and don't worry, I'm not reading every single word of all four of those chapters. That was your homework for this past week. But I want to hit a few main points in each of these, uh, these chapters, and just simply the idea of freedom. How many of you like the idea of freedom? When you hear the word freedom, that usually brings a nice feeling that we don't like being in bondage, we don't like being held down, but freedom brings a nice feeling to it. it it's kind of like the limitations are taken off of us. Think for a moment, the very first time you discovered a good all-you-can-eat buffet. I'm not talking about like old country buffet or any of those. I'm talking about the first time maybe it was on a cruise ship and you realize I can eat literally as much as I want and I can take it back to my room and nobody's going to tell me no. Or the very first time you go to Texas Day Brazil, if you've ever been, anyone Texas Day Brazil? Or, yeah, that's amazing. It's like they walk over, if you've never been before, a Brazilian steakhouse simply does this. You have a, a card that's green on one side and red on the other. When it's red, all these fantastic people with these amazing cuts of meat just walk by you. It's like a limitation, but then all of a sudden you flip it over to green and everybody is stopping at your table and it's, here's steak, here's steak wrapped in bacon, here's chicken, here's chicken wrapped in bacon. You start learning very quickly that the bacon wrapped options are the better options. <laughs> but you start realizing that I can have as much as I want and this is fantastic. But here's the thing is even at an all you can eat buffet, the best all you can eat buffet, there's still limitations. Let's imagine that you want lobster, but they're all out of lobster. As much as you would desire to have lobster, you couldn't have lobster. Or let's say that you really want pineapple, but pineapple's not in season right now. You can desire it, you can want it, you can request it, but there's still going to be limitations even amongst true freedom. And that to me is one of the things that we have to realize in Christianity is so often we can put our focuses on the limitations and the things that we think that we're not supposed to do that we miss out on all the freedom that we get to receive. So today I want to look through four different pieces of freedom that we get, that we see in Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8. The first freedom is going to be from chapter 5, and it's the freedom from wrath. How many of you have used the word wrath before? How many of you really know what the word wrath means? It's one of those that we can kind of easily throw out, but we don't really know the definition of it. So it can be one of two things. The first definition is this. It's a strong, vengeful anger or indignation. And the second is a punishment for an offense or a crime. Those are two drastic different definitions. A lot of times when people even talk about coming into church, somebody who they haven't been following God, they haven't, they know of God, they know scripture, they know the stories of Christmas and Easter and what Jesus supposedly did, but they don't believe it. And they have an opinion or a feeling that if they were to walk into a church, that a lightning bolt would surely strike them down upon entering. How many of you have ever heard somebody just even jokingly make that kind of comment before? Or like the, the Wicked Witch of the West, where all of a sudden water is going to be thrown on me and you're going to be melting. And it, People have this imagery of it, and here's part of the problem why they have that, is when they go to the definition of wrath, they go to the first definition, that uh, God is vengefully angry at them. That that's how they perceive God. That's what they think of God. Instead of thinking the second is, there's a punishment for an offense. Sin brings death. But Jesus came to conquer death. Here's the thing I want you to realize, that God is not this angry God who's sitting up in heaven throwing lightning bolts. That, that God of thunder is Thor, and he's in a movie on Friday, but that's not a real thing. Our God is a God who loves. While he may control the weather, he's not going to use his creation to destroy you. Why? Because he sent Jesus to die for us on a cross. The God that we serve is a greater God than that. When we look at Romans 5, 6 through 10, we see this. 
At just the right time, Christ died for ungodly people. He died for us when we had no power of our own. It is unusual for anyone to die for a godly person. Maybe someone would be willing to die for a good person, but here is how God has shown his love for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The blood of Christ has made us right with God, so we are even more sure that Jesus would save us from God's anger. Once we were God's enemies, but we have been brought back to him because his son has died for us. Now that God has brought us back, we are even more secure. We know that we will be saved because Christ lives. Here's our problem as people. When we think of the definition of wrath, we oftentimes choose that first definition, that God's an angry God. Why? Because it makes this whole sin problem, our, pro our issue as human beings, it makes it God's problem. God's the angry one. Where if we choose that second def definition, that it's an issue with a, a punishment or a crime that was committed, then it's our problem. When we realize the fact the wrath of God is dealing with sin and not his anger towards us, we realize that God has already supplied the answer. There is freedom from wrath. It's Jesus. When a world looks at Christianity and says, well, Here's your God, he's wrathful. Look what he did in the Old Testament. Look what he did here. Look at how he supplied a way out. And all the way through the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament, there is time after time where God is patient when he doesn't need to be patient. There is time after time where it shows love to people who are missing it over and over and over again. Yet God still loves his people so much that he would send his son to die on a cross so that none shall perish. The only reason why perishing happens is because we don't choose to acknowledge the fact that someone has to pay for our sins. Whether it's us or it's somebody uh, else being Jesus, somebody has to pay for those sins. And God already supplied the way out. We have freedom from wrath. We just have to acknowledge the fact that that freedom comes from Jesus and that we just need to walk in that truth. Romans 5 tells us that. As we move along and we enter into chapter 6, we see the concept of freedom from sin. Before I jump into chapter 6, I want to share something that was a big worry and stress in my life as a child. See, I grew up in the 90s. I had all the fantastic cartoons that today's cartoons do not compare to. And I was always worried that there is a problem that was going to face me in life. That problem is quicksand. How many of you have ever watched a TV show or cartoons where quicksand, like the, they get stuck in quicksand and all of a sudden they start sinking? Like, I was worried as a kid. Let me just be transparent. I thought that this was going to be a problem that I was going to be facing over and over and over again in life, that I was going to have to be careful to not sink in quicksand. I was stressed about this as a child. And so I would study the cartoons. This is like, what can I do to avoid quicksand? I am happy to say that I've reached this point in my life and I have never stepped foot into quicksand. I've got a nice streak going. I'm hoping that I can make it the rest of my life without entering in the quicksand. But here's the thing with cartoons, is what they tell you about quicksand, other than the fact that it's everywhere, is actually pretty true. If you were to leave here today and get stuck in quicksand, hoping it doesn't happen to you, but one of the, like the series of things that you're supposed to do is first, is you're supposed to kick off your shoes. If you have a purse, if you have a backpack, if you have anything that's weighing you down, to throw it aside as quickly as you can because the more weight you can get off of yourself, it will slow down your progression. Then the next thing you're supposed to do is remain calm. That the more you thrash around and try and move your way out, it's going to actually cause you to sink quicker you're then supposed to actually begin taking steps backwards. Because if you take steps backwards, you're able to get back on solid ground quicker. Because really what quicksand is, is just very, very wet sand that begins collapsing underneath you and pulling you down. So if you take steps backwards, you can get back on dry ground quicker. Then if there is somebody nearby, having them offer a branch or something that you can hold onto, you can grab onto, and they can pull you out. All of those things together will quickly get you out of quicksand. 
The thing with quicksand is it doesn't move quick. The, the name doesn't really apply to what really happens here. It's a very slow and gradual process, but the more you walk into it and the more you force yourself trying to get out on your own power, you begin qu sinking quicker and quicker and quicker. It's amazing how when we look at quicksand and we compare it to sin, how similar the two things are. In most instances with sin, we don't just get to a spot where it's going to destroy us overnight, but it's something that we unintentionally sometimes take a step into and we don't really realize what we're in. And you take that second step thinking, well, that was a weird step. Well, I wonder what happened here. And then you realize you're going a little bit deeper. And then you start looking around of what's, how am I going to get out? Maybe I just kind of keep taking step after step and I move further and further into it because eventually if I keep going, I can get myself out of this problem on my own. And how often we have that mentality, if I just keep going, I can get out of this issue on my own, but we never can because as we start entering into it, we get deeper and deeper and we get more and more stuck. We can't get out on our own. What's the quickest answer? Well, first off, removing the things that are hindering us and throwing them aside. Begin taking steps backwards and realizing this is where I made my error. So as quickly as I can, let me begin taking steps backwards to get back to safe ground. And let me look for people who surround me who can reach out and who can help me and who can help pull me out. Quicksand is so similar to sin in that regard that we have to realize I need somebody else to get me out of this. Well, let's look at the Savior who has already freed us from wrath to be the one who can pull us out. Romans 6, 15 through 23 says, what should we say then? Should we sin because we are not ruled by the law but by God's grace? Not at all. Don't you know that when you give yourself to obey someone, you become that person's slave? If you are slaves of sin, then you will die. But if you are slaves who obey God, then you will live a godly life. You used to be slaves of sin, but thank God that with your whole heart, you obeyed the teachings you were given. You have been set free from sin. You have become slaves to right living. Because you are human, you find this hard to understand, so I am using an everyday example to help you understand. You used to give yourself to be slaves to unclean things, or to unclean living. You were becoming more and more evil. Now give yourself to be slaves to right living. Then you will become holy. Once you were slaves of sin, at that time, right living did not control you. What benefit did you gain from doing the things you are now ashamed of? Those things lead to death. You have been set free from sin. God has made you his slaves. The benefit you gain leads to holy living, and the end results in eternal life. When you sin, the pay you get is death, but God gives you the gift, gift of eternal life. That's because of what Christ Jesus, our Lord, has done. Even when we enter into right living, we enter into walking this life out with Christ, we experience this true freedom in that we start realizing that when I take a step, I haven't messed up, that there is grace to cover me. That's, that's part of our struggle a lot of times is I take a step and I don't want anybody to know I took this step and I went in the direction that I shouldn't have went, that I'm ashamed of going, that so often if we were just to take that step back and be willing to allow people to see, oh yeah, they might have messed up, but look, they're changing their path. I don't think many of us truly sit back and say, you know what, let me keep the scorecard. This is how many times that person really has messed up. And if they, somebody is authentically doing that and they're keeping a tally of your mistakes, then they've got a bigger issue because they need to go to God and get their own life right because they need to not be paying attention to your sin, but they need to be paying attention to the freedom from that sin that comes for all that believe in Christ Jesus. That we need to be, as Christians, looking and seeing that person is free. If we're not celebrating their freedom as much as we're celebrating sin, then we need to check our own selves to see if we're following after what God has for us. That when we realize that we can take just steps back, okay, God, help me. I, made a mis I took a step forward. I'm not happy with that step. God, help me. Pull me back. And we start looking at other people who are struggling in sin saying, you know what? Let me grab onto you. Let me pull you back because this isn't where you're supposed to be going. But we don't allow people to take that step and like, oh, you didn't listen, so you're stuck there. And I'm going to sit here and I'm going to watch you sink. 
No, we need to be do every, everything we can to stand alongside them, to coach them, to encourage them. It's take that step back. Here's a pole. Reach onto this pole, doing whatever we can to help get them out because that's what Jesus did for each and every one of us. We have freedom from wrath. We have freedom from sin. The third freedom that we see in the book of or Romans chapter 7 is this, freedom from the law, which is a, is a nice amazing feeling because we can look at the Old Testament. We can see the system of here's everything that you had to do. And we've talked about in here before that there's ceremonial laws, there's cultural laws, there's moral laws, that the moral laws that were there before Christ, that Christ uh, backed up and that still exists in the New Testament, we still need to follow moral laws. Murder is still wrong. It was wrong in the beginning of time. It was wrong in Jesus' time. It's wrong now. That there's cultural laws that apply to them in biblical time that don't apply to us anymore. That would be a great example of this is Israelites at that time period didn't have to stop at stop signs. You might wonder why they didn't have to stop at stop signs because they didn't have them. And so oftentimes when we look at some of the laws that God laid out for them, even when it comes to, well, you can't eat this or you can't eat that, it becomes the issue of there wasn't modern medicine at that time. God was actually protecting them by saying, don't do this or don't do that. And then you have ceremonial laws. We don't have to take a lamb to a temple and have the, uh, a, a priest sacrifice the lamb to cover our sins because Jesus already was the lamb who was sacrificed for our sins of all time. We don't have to continue doing those ceremonial laws. Well, let me ask a question in here. This, this is going to be a matter of being truthful. So I'm not going to be able to back this up with anything. I'm not doing background checks at the end. But how many of you have ever been pulled over by the police before? Okay, a good amount of people. I've been pulled over by the police before. We have a lot of lawbreakers in the room today. <laughs> nice. How many of you have been pulled over multiple times? All right. How many of you have been pulled over because, and you know, like, as soon as those lights go on, you know exactly what you did, you know exactly the speed you might have been going or the fact that I, didn't, I wasn't supposed to turn there and I did or whatever it may be. You know you're guilty. You know that no matter how hard you try, you will not be able to talk yourself out of this ticket. Like you've already, you've braced yourself. Like I'm getting this ticket. It is mine. I'm going to, those points, they're going to be with me for the next five years. Bring them on. How many of you have been pulled over, you either didn't know what you did or you knew, like, I can justify this. I can talk myself out of this ticket. Anybody, like, who's got the confidence? Like, I, I absolutely, I can get out of this. Whether you're ready to turn the waterworks on, whether you're ready to, like, you've got a box of donuts next. I'm kidding. No, um, <laughs> but you're ready. Like, you've got your argument. I would much rather get a ticket for something that I know that I'm guilty for than getting a ticket for something that was an accident or I didn't know, like you're in a different city and you didn't know that there was a such and such light here. Or if you've ever, we've got a couple of them here, but when I was in uh, Eastern Michigan getting my undergraduate degree, there were all the, the different traffic lights where this intersection, you could, the, the green arrow to turn left would be after the traffic would go through, but then the next intersection, it would be before, and so then all of a sudden you get yourself in the middle of the intersection and you don't know what to do, so you turn left then red. Like, you get those moments where it's like, I didn't mean to do it. It was an accident. But just because there's an accident doesn't mean that you're free from responsibility for that. There was once a, a couple years ago where I got pulled over. I knew I was speeding. I was speeding with a purpose. Because Annie and I, we had been going over to some friend's house. We were going to, it was just the two of us and Lydia, our oldest at that time, and we were going to be playing games, and we knew that Lydia had been sick. We had taken her to the doctor. They did a, a culture to see different bacterial growth, and we get the call of, you need to get your daughter to the hospital, and we're living in Livonia. You have to get to Ann Arbor, about a 30, 40-minute drive immediately that this is a very potentially dangerous bacteria. You need to go now, get home, pack a bag. You're going to be in the hospital for a couple of days. I turn around, I get back on 275. I'm flying back home. I know I'm going 15 or 20 over the speed limit. In that moment, I really could have cared less. And so I get about 
three, four minutes from home. I'm getting off the expressway. I'm still going fast. I pull up to the, the stop uh, sign, and I do a fantastic rolling stop. I acknowledge that there's a stop sign, but I don't do what the sign actually tells me that I'm supposed to do. I make the turn, then as soon as I make the turn, there are the lights. The cop had saw me coming off the ramp, knew I was going too fast, saw me not stop at the sign, pulls me over and begins that slow walk up to the car where it, you know, like in the pit of your stomach, you know, like, I'm getting a ticket today. And so he says, do you know what you're doing? And I know a lot of times you're supposed to kind of deny what, what you did. I'm like, I don't know. What did I do, officer? I was like, I was speeding. And, and he's like, yeah, and you didn't stop at the, that stop sign. I'm like, you are correct, sir. I did not. Like, well, what's going on? I'm like, we just got a call from the, our doctor. Our daughter is potentially very sick. We need to get to the hospital immediately. Well, why aren't you going towards the hospital? Because they told us that we need to go home and get uh, clothes because we're going to be in the hospital for a couple days. Well, that doesn't seem like that adds up. You should be going right to the hospital. I'm like, I'm just doing what the doctor told me to do. It's like, well, then you should be going to the hospital. He's fighting with me over this. And something I said finally convinced him because I was at the spot where I was ready to make the statement to him. Give me the ticket or let me go. Like, I was, I was so frustrated. Give me the ticket or let me go. Because in that moment, a ticket didn't bother me. Points on my record didn't bother me. Having to take some silly online traffic uh, school course to get rid of those points didn't bother me. The reason being is there is only one thing that was on my mind, and it was getting my daughter, who was potentially very sick, to the hospital as quickly as, as I possibly could. Because the only thing that I could think about is points, yeah, they'll stay with me for five years. It makes me pay a higher insurance rate, whatever. A fine with a ticket, fine, I'll pay it. But I wasn't about to do the rest of my life finding out that I couldn't get my daughter to the hospital quick enough. That was not okay with me. And so thankfully we did get Lydia there and through a lot of prayer, basically this very potentially dangerous bacteria all of a sudden wasn't any threat whatsoever. Like they, I almost feel like the doctors and nurses because they, they had trouble getting the IV into Lydia. We had to watch as they were like jabbing around in, the, in this poor little girl. Like she was about one at the time. Eventually having to put the IV in, in her head. She, so she had a little cap over it. And I remember that was more painful than I think anything they actually did to treat her. But so she was fine and she was good, but I was not willing to allow something of this world to scare me because I was more concerned about my daughter. And when we look at Jesus, that's exactly what we see here too. Romans 7, 7 through 12 says, what should we say then? That the law is sinful? Not at all. Yet I wouldn't have known what sin was unless the law had told me. The law says, do not want what belongs to other people. If the law hadn't said that, I would not have known what it was like to want what belongs to others. But the commandment gave sin an opportunity. Sin caused me to want all kinds of things that belong to others. A person can't sin by breaking a law if that law doesn't exist. Before I knew about the law, I was alive. But then the commandment came. Sin came to life and I died. I found that the com uh, commandment that was supposed to bring life actually brought death. When that commandment gave sin the opportunity, sin tricked me. It used the commandment to put me to death. So the law is holy. The commandment also is holy and is right and good. The sin in itself is not bad. It's not wrong. But the law reveals what sin is. The, the, the law reveals how we are supposed to live right. And God knowing the fact that none of us would ever be able to fulfill the law. So in this moment... God knows that he has to send Jesus, his son, to live a perfect and sinless life because that's the only way that this old law, this old covenant could be fulfilled and that we could enter the covenant that we're in today of grace, that when you mess up, that when you enter into that quicksand, into that muck, that you have a way out because there's a Savior who already provided a way for us to be free, that so often we can get tied down and, well, this is what the law says and this and this, What's God, 
what's God saying right now? What's, what's God challenging you with right now? What's the Holy Spirit speaking to you right now? Because I, I promise you one thing, if we're listening for what the Holy Spirit is telling us today, of this is what I want you to do, this is how I want you to live, he's never going to go contrary to his scripture because scripture is God's word. It was there in the beginning. It was there at the time of Jesus. It is here now. And the end of the book is already written. We know who wins. We know how the story ends. So we have to live the way that God is calling us to live. But when we get so legalistic with people, then all of a sudden what we do is say, okay, you're stuck in the quicksand right now. Hmm. Have you kicked your shoes off yet? Have you thrown your backpack over? No, we would look at them and say, okay, let me grab this from you. Here, let me reach this out to you. Let me help pull you out. Even if I've got to reach over and potentially put myself in a difficult situation, I'm going to do whatever it is I can to pull you out because I don't want you being there. Because Jesus did the very same thing for us. Jesus coming down and dying on the cross, he put himself in a, dif in a difficult situation. We look at him in the garden, and he is in a spot in the garden where he makes this statement that if this can pass for me, God, please let it be, but your will be done. Your will be done. How often do we pray that over other people, that we desire to see people one to Christ? We desire to see people living the life that God wants for them, living the will that God has for them. But are we willing to say, God, not my will but yours be done? It's so easy for each and every one of us sometimes to have this attitude that says, you know what? I'm willing to go this far, but God, you've got to send somebody else or you've got to do something else or you've got to start changing them before I get involved. And those are all dangerous statements because that's not what Jesus did. We need to mirror after what Jesus did. When I got pulled over for that ticket, like I said, the ticket didn't scare me. When Jesus knows that he's about to go to the cross to be sacrificed so that mankind could be made new, and that mankind could spend eternity in heaven forever. He wasn't worried about the consequences. He knew it was going to hurt. He knew if there was another way that it could play itself out, then God, please send that way. But if not, I'm going to do it. Because he knew that despite what was going to happen to him on the cross on Friday, he knew Sunday was coming. And he knew that if Sunday comes, then mankind can be reunited with God under grace with no requirements other than simply accepting and believing and living the life that God has for them. That when we truly look at it and say, you know what, I don't want to live under the law. I want to live in grace because God has already provided that for me. He lived the perfect life under the law so that we didn't have to. So we have freedom from that law. And then finally in chapter 8, we see freedom from death. Romans 8, 1 through 17 says, those who belong to Christ Jesus are no longer under God's judgment. They're no longer under God's wrath. God's, uh, because of what Christ Jesus has done, you are free. You are now controlled by the law of the Holy Spirit who gives you life. The law of the Spirit frees you from the, life, or from the law of sin that brings death. The written law was made weak by the power of sin. But God did what, was, what, God did what the written law could not do. He made his son to be like those who live under the power of sin. God sent him to be an offering for sin. Jesus suffered God's judgment against our sin. Jesus does for us everything the holy law requires. The power of sin should no longer control the way we live. The Holy Spirit should control the way we live. So don't live under the control of sin. If you do, you will think about what sin wants. Live under the control of the Holy Spirit. If you do, you will think about what the Spirit wants. The thoughts of a person ruled by sin bring death, but the mind ruled by the Spirit brings life and peace. The mind ruled by the power of sin is at war with God. It does not obey God's law. It can't. Those who are under the power of sin can't please God, but you are not ruled by the power of sin. Instead, the Holy Spirit rules over you. This is true if the Spirit of God lives in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Christ. If Christ lives in you, you will live. Though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life. The Spirit does this because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of the God who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. So the God who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your bodies. He will do this because of his Spirit who lives in you. Brothers and sisters, we have a duty. 
Our duty is not to live under the power of sin. If you live under the power of sin, you will die. But by the Spirit's power, you can put to death the sins you commit, then you will live. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. The Spirit you receive doesn't make you slaves, otherwise you would live in fear again. Instead, the Holy Spirit you receive made you God's adopted child. By the Spirit's power, we call God Abba. Abba means Father. The Spirit himself joins with our spirits. Together they tell us that we are God's children. As his children, we will receive all that he has for us. We will share what Christ receives, but we must share in his sufferings if we want to share in his glory. This is the whole point of why we celebrate today. It's always interesting to me when we look at Easter and you see the culture celebrating Easter because there's an Easter bunny or there's Easter eggs and things of that nature where it's like, you are completely missing the point. I can look at something with Santa Claus and say, okay, you kind of get it. There's giving of gifts. But Easter, it's all about a Savior who loved us so incredibly much that he would die so that he could be resurrected, so that he could be made new, so that we could be restored, so we could be brought back in the right relationship. When we look at what Jesus did, it has to change the way that we live. It has to because we were made into a new creation. If we're not made into a new creation, then we're not in him. We have to have such a strong passion and strong desire that all people, that all people could come to repentance in Christ. The Good Friday service that we, we joined at Freedom Christian on Friday, it was one of the things that I said, and I, I know I've said it here, but if you've never heard me say it, I want you to hear me say it. There is never a person that you will make eye contact with that is your enemy. When we look at the Lord's Prayer, the Lord's Prayer is based off of deliver me from the evil one. But when we look at Matthew 26, when Jesus is about to be betrayed, he says, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of sinners. Because what happened to him was the plan. That was the sacrifice. That was what was going to happen. And he wasn't being delivered into the hands of evil. He wasn't being delivered into the hands of the enemy. He was being delivered into the hands of the very people who needed him. And it's easy to look at someone and say, well, you're against me, so there's no way you can be for me. But when we look at people in the eyes and we see that you were created in the image of the almighty God of the universe, and he wants a relationship with you. And that may even be you this morning, that you're sitting here and you're thinking, this all sounds good, but what does it mean for me? That God loves you so much that he, if it was just you that had sin, he would have sent Jesus just for you. He loves you that much. And as a church, we have to realize that every single person that we come in contact with, even the person who drives you the craziest, even if you're about to go to a family lunch or a family dinner and you know that there's a crazy uncle at the table, God died for them too. By the way, if you don't have a crazy uncle at your table, it could be you. I'm just saying. <laughs> every family's got one. But we laugh. But in reality, when we think about it, it's easy to look at other people and say, oh, well, yep, they're messed up. How messed up are we? How much sin have we struggled with? If we were to look, if, if I were to put up on this screen right now the story of your life, and everybody in this room gets to watch the story of your life, there'd be a lot of interest and intrigue of like, wow, look at, they made this choice or they made that choice. And you would be sitting there ready to cringe knowing, ooh, that moment's coming. I wish I could take that back. The beautiful thing is when we are made a new creation, and when we go before God one day, he will see Jesus. He will not see our mistakes. He will see Jesus, his son, not our sins. That God forgets our shortcomings because he sees Jesus in us. That's why it's important on a day-to-day-to-day -to -day -to -day basis that we look more like the son. One is so that when God looks at us, he sees his son, and we hear, well done, good and faithful servant. But at the same time, so that when other people look at us, they see there is something different here. There is something different about that person. That when we see Jesus, we see the example of him turning the other cheek, not so that he can be taken advantage of, but because he knows 
what's coming. He knows that if he is willing to turn the other cheek, then maybe, just maybe, this hurting, desperate person who's stuck in sin might change their ways. As Christians, that has to be the way we identify and say, you know what? I don't want you to take advantage of me, but at the same time, I also know that you desperately need Jesus. And if turning the other cheek in this moment allows you to see what's different in me, then I'll turn the other cheek. Because if Jesus was willing to do this, I'm willing to share in his suffering so I can share in his glory. That needs to be the plan for each and every one of us. Of the worship team, if you can come forward. There's four issues that I've brought up today. The first one is freedom from wrath. Second, freedom from sin. Third, freedom from the law. And fourth, freedom from death. And here's what I want to encourage each and every one of you with, is there's a decent chance that you could be struggling theologically and mentally with all, one of these different issues, all of these different issues. Let me just tell you this. If you walked in this morning and you're worried, if I had to face God today, I don't know what he would say because God would be so angry at me. He's not. He's not angry at you. He's not mad at you. He's not ready to throw a lightning bolt at you. In the story of the prodigal son, we see the father waiting for the son to come back. He's standing there waiting, and he's ready to kill the fattened calf. He's ready and says, my son is home. The son was willing to put himself in a spot of being just a servant, a slave in his father's household. And he says, no, you are my son. If you're here this morning and you feel like God's angry at me, he's not angry. The only passion that you see from him is a passionate, passionate love that he loves you so much. There is no passionate anger. There's no passionate fear that we should have. It should realize there is a wrath, but that wrath has already been paid by Jesus dying on the cross. It's a freedom from sin. You may feel like you're stuck in sin. You feel like I'm standing here. I'm sinking. I don't know what to do. Reach out because the price has already been paid. Jesus is waiting there to reach out his hand to grab you and to pull you back. Do not continue to keep walking straight forward into all of the, that sinking sand. We have a firm foundation. We have the rock that we base our faith on. That when we look at it, of all the, the problems and all the struggles we have, God's word's still here. Without diving into all the numbers, when you look at all the great philosophers compared to the Bible, there is more records of the Bible being authentic and true and more copies of the New Testament by thousands than there are of Aristotle and Plato and all of them. Yet we treat those as serious, but the Bible gets questioned. The Bible is true. I, I saw this the other day and I think it's so powerful. If you want any proof that the resurrection happened, look at Watergate. When you think of Watergate, you have powerful men who couldn't keep a lie together for three weeks. Here you have 12 disciples who the course of years maintain the exact same story and there's no flaw in their story. That the New Testament and their, their accounts of the Gospels have been continued to be passed and they cannot be proven false. We have freedom from the law today. If you're struggling with this, of, but this is what I'm supposed to do in this, just relax and understand that God fulfilled the law through Jesus dying on the cross. You do not need to beat yourself up in the attempt to follow after him. Just know that he loves you so much that he fulfilled the law. Now, as we follow after God, we will naturally do the things that the law calls us to do, and it will become easier and easier and easier to fulfill the law. But we're fulfilling it because the Holy Spirit is leading us, not because we're trying to maintain a list of things to do and things not to do. And then finally, we have freedom from death. We have life today because of Jesus. That is why we celebrate. We're going to be singing the song Resurrecting in just a moment. But here's the, the challenge I have for each and every one of us. I want you to bow your heads with me for a moment. This morning, I want to present the opportunity of accepting Christ. You may be dealing with any of these different things that you don't feel freedom from, but God wants to give you freedom from them today. If you have never accepted Christ in your life or you have walked away from him and you feel like I'm so far from God, I don't know what to do, I want you to raise your hand if you say, I want Christ in my life today. 
Thank you. Here's the simple thing I'm going to challenge you to do. We're going to worship. If you just raise your hand, we're going to worship right now. We're going to sing this song, Resurrecting. And I want you to sing this and have it be your anthem, be your prayer of, God, I want to live a different life. And then I'm going to ask you to come back to our welcome desk after service. We want to meet with you, talk with you, put a resource in your hands because we want to be a part of your journey. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for these hands that went up this morning. Lord, I pray for each and every one of my friends that is saying that I need Jesus desperately in my life. Lord, that you would just move in them in such a mighty way. Lord, that you would grant them the freedom that they need, whatever it may be from. Lord, I pray that as we just worship one more time this morning, Lord, that you would just bring your presence in this room. Lord, that you would help us to walk in the true life that comes because of Jesus being resurrected. Lord, there is no more death. Death has no power. Death has no sting. But Lord, it is all about you. Lord, be with us as we worship. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would just join me, let's just worship this morning.